I'm generally not a woo-woo kind of person. If I don't get something, I want to unpack it, get the facts. But the ocean, it's a part of me. You could say it runs in my blood. My grandmother was a free diver, an ama. She helped me feel its rhythm and understand how one breath could last a lifetime. We dove so often, the memories all run together. Except one. When I wished I could stay down forever. The ocean cast its spell on me that day. And its mystery still consumes me. I'm in and okay. Hey, Mariah, how's the new suit? Nice. A bit itchy, but I've had worse. How are you breathing? Breathing easy. This rebreather is amazing. Feels like I'm free diving. A genuine compliment. <laughs> Should have caught that on the live stream. Uh, give me a few minutes. I want it to be amazing, and I'm still getting used to this AR visor. Mariah, if you're okay, I'm going to start the live stream. Let's roll. Welcome to the OceanX livestream. I'm Dr. Mirai Soto, and I'll be your eyes and ears on this expedition. I'm joined today by two colleagues. Hello, I'm Andre. Hello, everyone. I'm Irina. That looks to be a sperm whale. I think I saw this bull from the sub. I wonder how far he's traveled. My name is Shane Garrow, and I'm the founder of the Dominica Sperm Whale Project. I've been following the lives of sperm whale families in the Caribbean Sea based off the beautiful nature island of Dominica. I've had the sort of greatest honor to spend thousands of hours in the company of the sperm whale families. And over the last 15 years, we've come to know 30 different families. We know about 10 of those personally. My research focuses mostly on the connection between these families' lives and what they say to each other, and how they succeed in the ocean by living in these small families. They live these rich and complex lives in part of the ocean that we find difficult to even explore. Sperm whale society is matrilineal, meaning it's grandmothers and daughters that will live together for life. The young males live in the family until they're about teenagers and then they go on this sort of open ocean wander for about 15 to 20 years before they are breeding age. But females will stay together for life. They communally raise and defend their babies and they live in this sort of community of neighboring families just like we do. Behavior is what you do, but culture is how you've learnt to do it. In the same way that we're all humans, but some of us eat with chopsticks and some of us eat with a fork. We're all still eating, but how we've learned to eat is importantly different. The secret for how these animals are surviving are these traditional behaviors, and that's why every calf counts. Every female calf is critically important, and each one of those that we lose, we lose so much potential. I think one thing that my research has shown is that our lives are really similar. 
the values that we have in our families. Love your mom, be a good neighbor, learn from your grandmother's experience. And ultimately, life is about the quality of the relationships that you build with those around you, whether you're a whale or not. The secrets that my grandmother learned are helping me to survive now. Ensuring that these grandmothers survive to be grandmothers to share their stories, and ensuring that these babies live long enough to learn them is what's gonna enable these animals to be around for a long time. Looks like we've got our first singer. Fantastic. Hopefully on your next dive, you can record his song to compare with other humpbacks in the area. Fun fact, in addition to being an engineering whiz, Andre is quite the musician. Are you still writing music? Not for years. Dry spell? More like raising teenagers. Uh, what is that sound? Did I break something? Uh, I've deployed acoustic modems to transmit from other sensors. For those of you who have no idea what he's talking about, he means we use sound to transmit data, so we can have Wi-Fi in the ocean. Impressive. What kind of bandwidth do we get? Eh, like 1990s dial-up. Fun alert. Looks like some young dolphins are having a play date. Ooh, company. Unbelievable. That sounds too close to be outside the research zone. One of the waypoints went down. Do you think that's related? Yeah, probably. Hey guys, can I take a turn? Well, you don't see that every day. At least I don't. Frankly, neither do I. I'm hoping to reconnect with the sperm whale family, whom I have been tracking for years. I'm excited to check in on our mother-to-be. Mirai clearly has a fondness for these creatures. She's fallen silent. Right. Let me finish scanning them all. I still don't see our pregnant mother. Done. Good. Everything all right? I am now. Look. Our mommy whale has delivered. Everyone say hi to her beautiful one-ton baby girl. Is she okay? nursing. I just wish all of you could be here for one second. <sighs> Amazing. That is the end of our stream. Like, share, comment. Remember, we need you. All of us down here. My family used to go to the beach every summer. For me, that was my favorite thing to do all year long, hearing the seagulls, the sound of the ocean pounding on the beach. For me, that was just grounding and relaxing and fascinating all at the same time. The physicality of the ocean is one of the things that, as a kid, attracted me the most. That thrill of just having that ocean energy push me along. You could just ride all day. There was no lift tickets. There was no fees to get into the ocean. When I describe to people what it's like to dive on a coral reef, they're like, oh, I never thought about that. They've never had a shark swim right beside them. Look them in the eye and give them a little fright for a second before they realize that the shark just wonders what I'm doing, just like I wonder what the shark is doing. I started free diving. So when I think of diving, I really think of free diving. Like, this is what whales do, right? Take a big breath of air, and they hold that oxygen inside their body. 
this ability to free dive down to where the scuba divers were, swim around and come back up, was just so free, nothing on, no equipment. I just love that, it made me feel like a fish. When I did my first submersible dive, I realized it wasn't just that I was meant to be out on ships. I was supposed to be in the bottom. I don't think anyone has ever measured endorphins in submarines, but I can tell you they're probably through the roof. The first time I was in a submarine, I saw that life down there and 50 new questions popped into my brain. That wouldn't have come up because it was this immersive experience and I just felt it. When you're in a submarine and you're looking at these magical environment, you're overwhelmed by this sense of wonder. You're humbled by this feeling of, there's so much I don't know about the world. And you're stimulated to figure out how this all works together. I'm a marine biologist. I'm someone who studies the ocean from as many angles as I can. When my kids ask me what I do for a living, I tell them that I'm an explorer. I'm an aquanaut. I dive down to the bottom of the ocean and I see things that people have never seen before. How lucky am I to be able to share this amazing habitat with the rest of the world? As a child, I had no idea how important the ocean is, that the great majority of life on Earth is in the sea, that the greatest diversity of life is in the sea. My name is Sylvia Earle. I'm a scientist, an oceanographer, an ocean explorer, I spent years at sea aboard ships and thousands of hours under the sea. I've seen things others have not. If others could see what I've witnessed, they would know how much the ocean has changed and they would know why caring for the ocean matters to everyone, everywhere. The ocean is Earth's life support system, generating most of the oxygen in the atmosphere, capturing much of the carbon dioxide produced by human actions. The ocean is the planet's living blue heart. Every creature has a story. Every one, whether you're looking at a little crab or a starfish or a shark. If people stayed on the shore and never got underwater, how would we ever know that fish, that they have communities, they have faces? Their importance as fellow citizens, as cultures, as amazing creatures that we can learn from. There's a lot of water we now know elsewhere in the solar system and elsewhere in space. But to have a, a liquid ocean with frozen polar areas, it's taken four and a half billion years to shape the world in a way that is favorable to humankind. It's taken us about four and a half decades to significantly unravel systems. No ocean, no life. No ocean, no us. Hello, Mariah. Thanks for checking in. Hey, Andre. Nice dive. How are you feeling? A bit tired, but I can't wait to get back out. Can you believe we found the family on the first dive? And they have a new baby girl. I know. Well done. Feeling settled in the sun. Has everything tested out? Tests? Mm, I knew I forgot something. This solo sub-test makes me nervous. We're definitely fitting it out for two pilots next time. Are you volunteering? Well, not if you're choosing the playlist. Snob. I think Arena was enjoying my tunes quite a bit on the trip out here. No comment. So, I have something I know you'll want to see. It's what the live stream saw of A12 and her baby. I didn't think you expected her to deliver so soon, though. I thought she had more time given her weight, but it was hard to know for sure. Hmm. What's the hmm about? Just noting her low weight. Also wondering when you'll find the rest of her pod. Maybe they were diving. I'll find them. Hey, I was thinking we should name the baby whale Andrea. She has your kind eyes. And my bald head. <laughs> no, I'm putting her in the sim as A17. Ugh, you're so sentimental. It's our sperm whale family again. All right, baby. We won't forget you now. Andre, can the zoom scan tell how old the baby is? Not with any certainty. Why? Just wondering if she's old enough to hunt by herself. I wondered. 
She still seems pretty young to go that deep. Will she be okay alone while her mother dies? She should follow the pod. Her aunties will babysit while the mother hunts. Wish I had them when my daughter was born. Mm, takes a pod. Mirai, why is the baby girl so important to your study? I'm hoping to follow the baby for years to learn from her as she learns from her family, and hopefully to watch her eventually become a mother herself. Here we are, the whale we're designating Humpback M1. Oh, so catchy. Andre Software is helping me understand the structure of their songs so we can try singing back. More like playing back. I'll synthesize a song that mirrors one from another region to see how these whales react. Because Andre doesn't like my singing. It's more the songs you sing, actually. Approaching Humpback M2. Looks like he's on a date. How can you tell? It's like they're dancing to his song. What do you think, Andre? Do you think he can make it as a solo artist? Uh, not without more original material. Males from the same region sing nearly identical songs with just enough variation to stand out. Yeah, just like those pop singers. Such a snob. Let's hope the whale of Palooza continues. Wonder if they charge admission. Don't worry, whatever it is, you can take it from my budget. Someone's feeling better today. Well, I guess it worked. I've got some nasty noise. Same damn sound we heard yesterday. Well, I'll check it out between the whales. Looks like another area sensor. Okay, Mirai. Can you use the micro tanks to mark the starfish for collection? Are you testing your collector drone? It's not a test. Irina needs us to collect a few for study. They are incredibly resilient. They can regenerate themselves from just a subset of their body. They're also invasive. Must have hitched a ride in the ballast of a ship. Irina, how many of these do you need? I'm missing the whales. Just a few. Are you sure this is where you track that noise? I don't know, Andre. That sound is loud, but it seems pretty deep. Can't see how it could be coming from a ship. Yeah, I agree. It also keeps starting and stopping. I'll figure out another way to investigate it. You weren't this excited about the dolphins before. They're rubbing against the coral. Kind of a wellness visit. I have colleagues that are studying the antimicrobial properties of these coral. Hey, Andre, those reef sharks like your ringtone. Will I be able to get the data off that sensor while I'm picking it up? No. It goes to sleep when the power is low to preserve the data. Hmm. 
Whoa! Did you see that? A shame I wasn't on the live stream. Have you seen one do that before? Never! I'm picking up a tag from the sperm well pod. Pushing the waypoint now. On my way. Sorry, Sharks. Mirai is off the menu. The baby's back with the rest of the pod. What's it doing? Nuzzling. Probably calling for its mama. Are you calling for your mother? Got to be kidding me. Yeah, I hear it. There they go. That was our shot. Can you send the sub to pick me up? I'm done for now. It's a big ocean. You gotta be able to see what's worth spending your time on. When I'm down there in a submarine and I'm seeing all these animals, it's always about which one of these is new? Which one of these has not been seen before to science? Why do these animals come here as opposed to there? And, and where are they going? There are really tangible things that we can do now to start answering some of these questions. But as the technology develops, we can become more and more and more and more sophisticated. Technology is emerging on all fronts. We're using all this side scan sonar and hydrophones to map things out. We can use these sound underwater surveillance systems to actually track whales and see them move all around the ocean. There's a new field called environmental DNA where you just look at the sloughed off cells that are in the water to know who is there. Oh, the whale shark was just here. Can we follow it? And you sniff the trail of the whale shark's DNA. How am I going to understand a shark if I'm thinking like an old world primate? We're totally different. It took me several years to look at the eyes, to look at the hardware, to measure the light, and to build the camera so we could get all these hints into how that shark might be seeing the world. It's like a detective story. What we know as humans about whales comes from just a few scientists so far, like Roger and Katie Payne. They had background in music, and by kind of mapping out the songs, noticing that if they would look at this almost like a song sheet, every 15 minutes or so, there would be a repeat. Only male humpbacks sing, but the function of their song is still mysterious. The general belief is that whale songs serve the same purposes that bird songs do, as ways for males to advertise for mates and to challenge rivals. But why they change their songs is still unknown. Taking that information from whales and passing that to us humans was one of the most transformative pieces of narrative to feed the Save the Whale movement and maybe save some whales from extinction. These animals are sharing this world that might have been millions of years going on in their world. And suddenly, for the first time, we as humans are tuning in. Hey, Mirai. How are you? <sighs> Doing all right. How are you feeling? Any better? A bit. 
I might finally be getting my sea legs. Next step, diving. <laughs> One step at a time, Irai. <laughs> okay, but I promise you, it'll change your life. Is Andre with you? No, just me. Andre is analyzing some sound files in the other lab. I think I may have upset him. You upset him? Or that noise upset him? Because it certainly upset me. He was overreacting, and I pointed it out. I was not overreacting. Andre, I didn't realize you were on. What did you find? This is video and audio from your last dive. And this is an analysis of the sound that spooked the family. And this sound is from a Canadian marine acoustic scientist. I think the findings are pretty clear. The signatures sound the same to me. He gave me the same test. Andre, who is messing with my whales? Deep sea miners. Here? In the research zone? It's off limits to commercial activity. And when has that ever mattered before? We don't know that they are in the research zone. They may be just outside it. We knew they were doing an impact study nearby. What are they after? That might give us a clue. They're looking for rare minerals to make solar panels. Could the sound cause trauma to the whales? The acoustic specialist said it might push them to quieter hunting grounds, but was unlikely to cause acoustic trauma. So what's the move? We should use our mapping drone to investigate their activity. And this is where our debate turns into an argument. We need their drone to map the deep sea vents before Mirai dives there. The biochemistry of these vents is the perfect cocktail for creating new life forms. If there is illegal activity there, we have to stop it. Otherwise, there will be no life forms. Why spend our short time here policing rather than researching? Let's be scientists. Mirai, your dive, your call. I'll dive in the vents without a map. Nobody messes with my whales. I'm in and okay. I always feel like I'm swimming in place in the open ocean. Think the Explorer drones will flag me as biodiverse? You're not what they're looking for. And that's what everyone says. Hey, a newcomer! That song sounds familiar. Now to get there before the noise from Andre's minor friend scares them all away. He wants to raise my blood pressure. Has anyone been tracking them? I'm still waiting to see if there's a match. Andre, are you seeing this? Is that a leatherback turtle? I didn't think there were any left here. What happened? Egg poaching, and the nesting beaches got too warm. Bio sample acquired. Do you think your turtles are making a comeback? Well, I wish I could be optimistic. It's just as likely our turtle is taking the long route home to somewhere else. These animals travel thousands of kilometers, navigating open oceans that have no physical landmark. They have that inert ability to find their way. They're only sharing our beach for a short point in time, but they need protection because man has brought an ancient species to near extinction.
I got involved at a time when hostilities were very real. People came with guns and machetes, the poacher turtle. We would protect these animals at all costs. Because on the high tides, when the tide comes up, this area here will be flooded, right? So when the sea turtle lays her egg, the nest requires a constant temperature. And if we recognize that this nest is in a real bad spot, we choose a spot further inland on the beach that's stable. And then we would evaluate if the eggs were able to hatch because of us moving them. And in both cases, we're always right. So as the villagers began to benefit from the tourism that turtle conservation was creating, they saw that the turtle was worth more to them alive than dead. The children really love sea turtles. We educate them, but we involve them. And by so doing, we get them to a level of interest where they want to become actively involved. When we first started this conservation work, we would encounter at the height of the nesting season 30, 40 turtles. Now we encounter over 500. That's significant. Some people argue, well, that's nature. Leave them. Why protect them? Remember, humans have to intervene sometimes to help nature keep existing. Andre, the buoy is glitching. I don't know what range you've set, but I think I'm hearing all the animals in the Pacific. Yeah. Too many sound signals for the software to keep up. I don't know what kind of party I'm crashing, but pretty sure I'm gonna love it. It's a bait ball. Humpbacks? Orcas? Very unusual, but everyone's gotta eat. I'm safe down here. I'll try not to be mistaken for a fish. Of course dolphins show up. Never like being left out of the action. They want leftovers. Good luck to them. They're up against bigger stomachs. Here they are. You were right, Andre. I guess I didn't just swim across the Pacific for nothing. Are there fewer than before in this pod? Or am I just getting faster at tagging? No, oh, definitely fewer. But maybe the others are hunting. No, no, don't leave me. Well, the mother stayed with the baby this time. Okay, ready for playback? I've prepared a coder you can activate from your dive watch. First attempt to speak whale. 
Hopefully I won't offend her. Echo clicks. I could feel it across my body. Just checking me out. First contact. She zoom scanned you. You have no idea what that felt like. She was looking right at me. Whew. You have no idea. <laughs> If people stayed on the shore and never got underwater, how would we ever know that fish like one another? When you see fish interact with other creatures, like the octopus and the grouper, who go fishing together, they communicate in ways that we don't know what they're saying, but they know what they're saying. They've been on the earth for hundreds of millions of years. They've had a long time to figure out these close relationships. Sharks actually might prey on dolphins in a natural setting, but when they are presented with a bait ball, then they work together for this common goal to feed on the fish. We had very large bait balls spread over probably half the size of a football field. We had mobula, we had dolphins. The bait was shifting everywhere. Animals were coming in, moving out, just moving so quickly. So we have some orcas around the bowl and also under. So everybody works together as a team, herding the fish. Males, female, everybody is doing this and they will eventually share the stunned fish afterwards, which is pretty amazing to see there is no competition. So everybody's working together and everybody is sharing the prey afterwards. It really takes a long time of being in there, watching the same species of fish to figure out these really interesting things that they're doing. So I think that there's probably a lot of really interesting behaviours out there that we haven't even discovered yet. Bad news. The drone we had tracking that intrusive noise, it's gone. Lost contact hours ago. I'll keep monitoring the hydrophones for that noise, but as of now, unless the drone resurfaces, that's all we've got. I'm in and okay. And we're streaming. Hello everyone, welcome, or welcome back. I'm diving near a sea mount region, also known as the Twilight Zone, because it is just beyond reach of the sun. And we'll be taking some questions live, so be nice. We'll also be testing a playback system to interact with whales. Want to hear something cool? So do I. I'm hoping that buoy can send a little message to our humpback friends. That's right. Andre is going to serenade some humpbacks. <laughs> well, not me, but using a song I generated from other recordings. Okay, time to see if any humpbacks respond to our song. Jordan wants to know how you will know. Great question. If we have recorded him before, we'll see if the influence of our song affected his. Scientists believe whales from one region can influence the song of whales from another when they mix. Andre, we've recorded a song from this one before, right? We have. How quickly can you compare his two songs? Well, I need to wait for his song to complete at least one full cycle. And how long is that? Mm, 20 minutes, maybe more. Wow, that's a long, slow ballad. Another leatherback turtle, Andre. And feasting on some moon jellies. That is odd. 
Is that the same one we saw before? Hmm. It looks bigger, but let me zoom scan it to be sure. We can run the sample in the lab, but I am sure this is a different one. Do they typically travel together? Wouldn't it be surprising to find two this far off course? Yes, it would be. And yet, here they are. Welcome back, turtles. Enjoy your beautiful moon jellies. Moon jellies are beautiful. There's a decent chance this jelly will regenerate itself. Do you tell. In fact, a few species of jellyfish are technically immortal. They can revert from being full grown to their younger state and essentially start their life cycle over. Thank you, Arena, who will make us all immortal one day. I know it seems like Andre worries about everything, but I really understand where that comes from. Everyone's seen the pictures, but I can tell you it was really tough to be doing hands-on work when we were losing entire species. For me, it was the whales. But for Andre, it was the turtles. I stayed to help him. Several of the other scientists did as well. By then, only Andre's protected nests were the ones producing turtles in the region. We all figured that the population was going to collapse, and eventually it did. But seeing this large man spend day after day carrying tiny turtles from the nest to the water. It inspired us to stay. I mean, coming back now, it feels like another world. Andre is not an angry man, Arena. He's just a man who gets angry when he sees people say it's too hard or that they don't care at all. Jellyfish have mechanisms of self-repair. They're constantly getting like bitten by turtles and chunks getting taken away. 50% of the jellyfish population are wounded. So they've gone through 500 million years living, persisting in the ocean in simplicity, and they've come up with some remarkable ways of living. There's something called the immortal jellyfish and how they age, aging in reverse, which we're just beginning to understand, where they get old and then degenerate back into a youth again. In understanding the gene pathways and how this happens, this could look at, you know, humans, we don't have this capacity to age in reverse. I don't, it's like Benjamin Button and it's here. And it just takes the kind of focus and dedication to look at that jellyfish and to grow that jellyfish and to figure out how to use the best available scientific tools to get at this question. It's just about kind of looking super deeply and letting the secrets unfold. Great, I've been waiting for this. I've just activated your UV light. First of all, don't mess with my suit when I'm diving. Secondly, you spoiled my surprise. What am I looking for here? Oh, one of our sperm whale tags must have fallen off. Andre, you really need better glue for these. I don't use glue. I've tracked down the tag. It's... In a cave, I wonder how it got in here. Oh, what the? Why? <laughs> An octopus. Uh, are you okay? Other than getting inked in front of a live global audience? You know, you might want to get that off you. It will probably attract predators. <laughs> oh, wonderful.
Swell sharks have developed biofluorescence to communicate with each other. Their eyes have special adaptations for the UV light. Now you can see what a swell shark sees. That's what I'm talking about. The energy from our star flies through the universe, through our atmosphere, and hits us at the ground. But now, when we go underwater, the ocean properties of water are like pure blue filter. So it's going to filter out all these other wavelengths except blue. As you go down further, it's primarily blue, blue, blue till 700 meters. And at that level, there's still faint photons of sunlight in the blue range. And we call this the twilight zone. And there, animals are still perceiving a tiny little bit of our sun's energy. Below this, it's gone 24 7 darkness. And it turns out that there's a ton of color vision down in the deep. So it's like they're making enough light down there to be able to be satisfying all the eyes of the deep sea creatures. So it's not this totally dark world down there. It's still light. It's just the animals are making the light rather than the sun. We've designed all this technology to kind of satisfy our visual hardware. As I started looking at other animals, they have totally different hardware. And I've been looking at everything through these silly little primate eyes. We have to overcome our humanness to jump behind the world of a shark or another creature and see the world from their perspective. We found a biofluorescent shark, and it only sees right at the blue-green interface. So it's really just tuned to a very similar spectrum to the environment it lives in. This fluorescence was creating greater contrast for the shark. It's like this endless well of information. We're at the very tip of the iceberg. Sperm whale, I think it's, yes, it's hunting. First time we'll be able to document it with Andre's technology. Buzz. I got it. Raj from Mumbai wants to know what's the buzz? I think he was making a joke. Got it. But what is the buzz? How is it used? We're not entirely sure, but definitely associated with being close to prey. This is just a warm up. The real fun will come in the deep. Andre, Andre. Well, there's no way these little ones are thousands of miles off course. Right, Andre? Give him a minute. Right, let's scan a few of these to get their gender. There's a tiny tag here. Andre? Chen from Shanghai wants to know why you care about their gender. Well, their sex is determined by the temperature of their nests. The warming beaches wiped out the turtles in this region. Believe in a little magic now, Andre? They may just start, but let me check on that tag first. Oh, wow. Glad we didn't miss this. I think we've found our spot for our first deep dive. Mirai, check out that one closest to you. What's that on its skin? Not sure I can catch them. They're headed to the surface. It might just be a scrape from a ship strike. Yeah, let's hope that's all it is. Let's end it here. Hi, Mirai. Sorry to miss the post-dive brief. 
I'd been listening to our humpback recordings for hours and got myself in a kind of funk. Actually, I started listening to the humpbacks and then switched to Miles Davis. Anyway, I don't see any clear sign that our playback influenced any of the other whales yet, but I just know we're on the right track. I'm sorry to be in such a mood. Don't know what to make of those turtles or what's going on with our sperm whale family. Right. Catch you in a bit. I'm in and okay. Are you sure I can't talk you into another test dive at this step before we stream? Enough test dives. It's not like I'm doing a spacewalk. Well, with this suit you probably could. Are we gonna talk about suit crush depth again? I think we can probably roll. Starting the live stream. Welcome back, ocean friends. Tonight, I am deep. Midnight zone, no light from the surface deep. Tonight, we're using Andre's lure drone to mimic the Atolla jellyfish to lure large predators like the giant squid. <laughs> it's certainly not all my tech. I'm building on years of prior research. Don't forget our mission to the brine pools. Oh yes, Arena will fill you in on that later. Okay, Andre, how do I find the lure drone? Look for blinking red lights in the water column. Andre, have you done this before? I haven't, but others have. How long until we can expect the lure to attract a predator? <sighs> it's hard to say. It's a big ocean. But if you lose patience, I would find some real Atona jellyfish. I have a feedback system set up to improve the lure as you scan them. Of course you do. For those watching, we will be scanning these Atola jellyfish to make sure Andre's lure matches the real thing. It does, but it can always be refined. Not much confidence in humanity, but plenty in himself. Got the jellyfish scans, though Andre doesn't need them. In truth, they should improve the lure. I would not waste your time. Getting a few impolite comments on the screen pointing out that giant squid don't feed on Atolla jellyfish. They're right. Actually, the Atolla puts on this light show when under attack in order to lure creatures big enough to eat their attacker. Might have some useful human applications. I think we need more Atolla scans to approve the lure. Okay, whose idea was it to live stream this particular dive? I am glad I can't see the comments. I would agree. My grandmother had a saying for times like this. I, I'm not going to try my grandmother's accent on a live stream, but loosely translated, it means if you get bored waiting for a giant squid, you can always go to a pride pool. That's a pretty specific saying. <laughs> I know how much you enjoyed that, but do you mind if we check out the brine pool before we check on our whale cam? If you insist, you got what you wanted. This is my giant squid. Hmm. Is that another one of your grandmother's sayings? No, but she often used this one. Hurry up and collect my specimens for me. What an expressive language. It's no giant squid, but I promise you, you won't have to wait to find it. Hmm. <laughs> 
At long last, welcome to the brine pool. I know it's really a salt lake under the ocean, but it looks more like a witch's brew. I have been teasing Arena, but a brine pool is a diverse micro-environment within the ocean. It has its own ecosystem. And each one is unique. So that means the microbiology is unique and could hold groundbreaking solutions to human problems. Each time I take new samples into a lab here on this ship, it's this magical discovery. fund my own research so I can pursue what I know to be important. And people ask me, how much money are you going to spend to collect some bacteria at the bottom of the ocean? If these bacteria hold the cure for a disease that relieves even just a small amount of human suffering, how do you put a price on that? That is some giant squid. Bri. Pushing you a waypoint. Sperm whales are back on the hunt. Look for the drones. They will seek out the sound of the sperm whales and then idle nearby. We hope that today, Andrea's tech will make it possible to document how a sperm whale hunts the giant squid. Let's go tag some sperm whales so we can eavesdrop on their hunting. One of our viewers wants to know if there is a problem with the link since the waypoints keep appearing. No problem. The drones are in stealth mode, so they will only track the whales by sound. I better swim fast. We'll keep good watch over you. What just happened? I think the squid knocked the camera right off. I had that camera feed in full screen on my visor, and for a second, I thought it was lights out for me. Sounds like a good time for the sub to pick you up. Live stream out. Sound to whales is everything. It's their hands. These are animals with the biggest brain on Earth and the most powerful sonic apparatus. They spend a lot of their time deep down. They're, they're diving for an hour at a time in darkness. Just like a submarine is echolocating, they're kind of... They ping a signal out, and then they wait for that signal to bounce off something and come back as the signal. And from that information, they could get an idea of what's there. They constantly click, and uh, that, that click sometimes can be really loud, and uh, you can feel it in your body. It's like uh, going to a DJ and that feeling that bass. Once I had an experience with a sperm whale, it clicked, my ears almost like bounced back. It's really an amazing feeling, you know. You don't develop a huge, complicated brain if you're not using it. Whales have little channels of communicating where they could talk to each other hundreds of kilometers away using sound. Sperm whales make clicks in sort of rhythmic patterns that we call codas. Any family might have 20 to 25 different coda patterns that they use when they're having conversations with each other. And some of them are unique to different places in the world. In the Eastern Caribbean, they make a lot of what we call a one plus one plus three. That sounds kind of like this. And that's only ever been recorded in the Caribbean. And it's been identical for the last 35 years. These are really different ways of life that are being labeled by these coda patterns. In the same way that human language is kind of a shorthand for where you come from. You can make a lot of missteps when traveling simply by speaking incorrectly or introducing yourself differently. Do you hug, do you shake hands, do you bow? And a growing concern has to do with the noise that we're putting into the ocean. Everything we do impacts everything they're doing. 
the sound is causing high levels of stress in animals like this. No one wants to live at a rock concert. You can imagine trying to have your home inside an arena while some metal band is playing. And that's increasingly what the ocean feels like. Brine pools are amazing habitat. It's a lake on the bottom of the ocean. And it's this surreal seascape. Chemically, each one of them is unique. These brines undoubtedly contain bacteria, archaea, and viruses that are unknown to science. We know that they're incredibly rich in undescribed life forms. They have the perfect cocktail, the perfect recipe for life. These sites aren't just salty, they can be violent, characterized by eruptions and incredibly unstable conditions. So to live in them, you have to not only be hardy, but you have to be able to endure constantly changing conditions because not one day is the same. The organisms that live there, they undergo a constant biological warfare with each other to dominate the environment, to survive in the system. The biochemicals that they produce to do that biological warfare are applicable to curing diseases like cancer, Alzheimer's. They produce antibiotics and antivirals that can also be used to improve human health. And we drop targets as we go, so we know exactly where we sample. Exploring these habitats is absolutely necessary because the metabolic potential there has the capacity to change the way we think about medicine, to change the way we think about antibiotics based on our knowledge that we gain from studying these incredible environments in the deep sea. Imagine if I was sent in to go study the Mona Lisa and I come in with a pair of snippers and I'm like, I'm gonna need to cut this baby up a little bit to see what kind of chemical composition is going on there. Like, you wouldn't do that, right? We don't have to kill these animals. We don't have to kill to understand. If we could do a single cell, that means we don't need to kill 20,000 animals to be able to really understand that one. We could do our work much more non-invasively. So we are working uh, this year on a new project to deploy uh, tags on orcas. We need to learn more about uh, the diet and how they use the habitat. So by deploying those tags, we get the information we need. It is the least invasive method, it is suction cups. So it is not a scratch on the whale afterwards, which is something we really like. In the deep sea, we use these like robotic claws from the oil and gas industry that gets you the sample, but this is so archaic. So we've been designing something called squishy robot fingers, which are ways to be gentle when we study the deep sea. But I think we could even take this another level. There's some organism, we quickly encase it. It's like a medical checkup. We give it a swab to get its genome. We image it from all directions. We open it up, that animal goes away, and we have more information than we've ever had before. These animals are Mona Lisa's. Our perception of them should change. We should be more delicate. I'm in and okay. Remember, no boys and no waypoints. I put a simple version of the mapping system on your Manta drone. Now, we won't get your feed live, so we'll hear you, but won't see what you see. I really wish we hadn't lost that mapping drone. Relax. You know I've got this. Unnecessary chatter to a minimum to help you focus. Roger that. No chit chat. Singing's okay though, right? Arena, how will I know the difference again between a dormant vent and a live vent? Well, the live vents would have 400 degree water streaming out, so that's one way. Check. Wide berth on the live hydrothermal vents. Sorry. I thought my mic was muted. This is a dormant field. No live vents.
Neither of you are gonna believe this. I think I found the mapping drone. Really? No way. Can you scan it to make sure? Scan confirms. I thought you programmed it to track the noise from the miners. I did. I definitely did. Maybe you never committed the change. You were pretty exhausted that night. Yeah, maybe. Okay. This dive just keeps getting stranger. How hot did you say that water typically is in a live vent? Is that a joke? No joke. Well, we're down one drone, but discovered an unmapped vent system. Mira, this is great. I truly believe that these systems are the key to understanding the origins of life. Thank you so much for doing the dive under these conditions. Actually, that might be the answer. What? To why the drone died. We were talking about the origins of life. My mind won't stop if it can't fit all the pieces together. The mapping drone may have cruised too close to the vent. It's got more delicate equipment on its underside that are not rated for anything close to that temperature. You sound almost pleased. Well, it's better to know the flaws so you can fix them. the silent treatment, but I think I just discovered a new species of octopus. I'm not sure I can confirm that with just one scan. Sorry, didn't copy that. Arena, did you expect volcanic activity here? Describe, please. Red, glowing, need more? Mirai, I would give that a very wide berth, like maybe from your sub. Are you kidding me? Describe, please. I can't. I, I mean, I don't want to. Mirai, you're making me uneasy. Seriously, we'll look at it together when I'm done with the dive. sick? Are you okay? Just getting a few last scans. Hydrothermal vents are located on the seabed, often in deep water, but sometimes in shallower water. And they form in areas where new oceanic crust is being formed. 
You can have 400 degree water here and two degree water over here. It's an accelerometer for chemistry and you can form organic compounds in the absence of biology. Everybody's interested in vents because of the metals, including humans, but the metals are sort of the nuclei for life. When you think about what's required for life, you've got to have an energy source, you've got to have a system that's able to utilize that energy source, and the organisms sort of co-evolve with the rock. And in my mind, that's probably how life originated. There are reservoirs of precious metals in the deep sea, and we do have societal needs for precious metals. It's very short-sighted and dangerous to exploit resources in ecosystems that we don't truly understand how those ecosystems function. Deep sea mining is when people go out and extract minerals from the seafloor. People do this because a lot of the minerals that we have on land are actually being depleted, like copper and zinc. So we're looking to the ocean to get those minerals. We want these minerals for solar panels primarily, and we want them for cell phone boards. It's necessary to advance society and get us off fossil fuels. We simply have no idea about the environmental consequences of a lot of these actions that we're taking in the deep sea. We have tended to go for the quick benefit and we'll deal with the consequences later. Well, I think that has caught up with us. We don't know enough right now to effectively, selectively mine the deep sea without catastrophic consequences. The science has always lagged behind the industrialization. I would like for once to see the science ahead of the industrialization and have the science define the limits of the industrialization. We watched the video log from your dive. I'm truly heartsick. I'm furious. Where should we start? The destroyed vent. I couldn't believe how badly the seabed was chewed up. Vents that might have had a fossil record dating back over a billion years. And microbial life that doesn't exist anywhere else on the planet. Who knows what cures we've lost. Your drone's a fallen hero, Andre. I think it spooked the miners before they did more damage. If you hadn't been willing to dive without a map, we would never have confirmed they were actively mining. Who gets the satisfaction of turning them in? We were debating that before you came on. We should jointly report. It'll be stronger. Agreed. Agreed. Now tell us about the whale fall. Could you ID the whale? The whale fall was definitely from the baby's family. The tail fluke was intact enough to scan it. But you are sure it wasn't the mother? It wasn't the mother. The ID matched another whale we know from her family. But it was an older whale, so it could have been from natural causes. Do you think there's any connection to the miners? They did plenty of damage, but... I don't think the whale fall is on them. I can pull out anything from the scan log that might be worth investigating. Already have. Can you turn these into dive objectives? Right. Catch you in a bit. I'm in and okay. This area looks so different at night. I used to love diving in the moonlight. The pod was active in this area as recently as an hour ago. When was the last tracking data for the baby or its mother? Days ago. But they could be with the pod right now and just not making any noise. First waypoint. They'll load automatically from here on in. I have the Explorer drones patrolling to get as many eyes and ears looking for the pod as possible. Do I need the buoys? No, we'll use the hydrophones on the drones. They don't have the range or fidelity of the buoys, but we need speed. Thanks. Mariah, you know that no chatter rule was just for the vent area, right? I'm sorry? I think he's pointing out that you seem distracted. Sorry. I'm back. Talk to me about something positive, Andre. Were you able to make contact with the teenagers you were telling me about? They've been helping the leatherback turtle population we found here in the region. They've developed a nest cooling technology to help the baby turtles. They've also built their own tracking drones. Teens with tech. Sounds like you've inspired some citizen scientists, Andre.
I found the underweight orca. If you can easily collect a sample, we might as well screen him for toxins and pathogens. I don't remember having dolphins in the dive objectives. I added them because of their role in the disease that hit the dolphin population a few years back. Done. Andre, have you picked up any tags from our pod? No, not yet. I'm gonna widen the radius for the Explorer. You're on. The drone on the out of patrol just picked up several sperm whales on visual. Thanks. No sound alerts at all. They're being awfully quiet. I think I found the pod. Yes, that is them. I don't see the baby, but it's a little dark. Why are they moving? They're sleeping. If you don't mind, I'm just gonna mute my calm while I get the samples. I don't think they can hear us through your visor. I think she is the one that is needing some quiet. Thanks, Arena. Catch you at the sub. Mariah out. I study things that are beyond their wildest imaginations and that I see things that are brand new to science and to people and to humanity every day. I'm at home in these kinds of environments. It's funny, I, I'm more comfortable here than I probably am on the outside. It wasn't just that I was meant to be out on ships. I was supposed to be in the bottom. I was supposed to be in the deep water. I was supposed to be doing those things that nobody had ever done before. It completes who I am. Being a deep sea scientist, it does require sacrifice. I mean, we're away from our families for weeks on end, sometimes months on end. It's a constant struggle because you miss parts of your kid's life. My oldest daughter was about to turn three when the oil spill happened in 2010. I was in sea a lot. So between 27 months and 36 months, I was gone probably more than I was there. When I came home after a five week stint in the Gulf, she came running up to me in the airport. She had transitioned from a toddler to a little girl, and the little girl was gone, and there was this other person there, and you don't ever get that back. It was a decision. I was just like, okay, I'm gonna miss transformations, I'm gonna miss really important things. Is it worth it? I had talked to her class about the ocean, and one of her friends said something to her, and she responded, you know, my mommy, she's the ocean doctor. The ocean is sick, and she's trying to make it better. She couldn't even say important. She's like, it's really important. But she understands that it's an important job. Every time before I leave, I say, my most important job on this planet is being your mother. But this is part of me, too. Hello, Mirai. It's me. I don't see a sample from either the baby or the mother. Andre said you were going back out to look for them. I know you are still deciding, but I told him you're thinking about leaving the expedition early. As soon as I have results, I'll let you know. Mirai, I think I have a location for the mother and baby. They were spotted just outside the research zone by those teenagers I was telling you about. Now, I don't have much data, but... The report doesn't sound positive. 
I'll let Harina know as well. I'm in. Right. Are you sure you want to do this dive? I'm okay. And you're sure you want to record in our streaming format? Yes. Ready? Recording now. Tonight we're recording from the open ocean in the Western Pacific. For those of you who are returning, we're trying to get an updated status on the mother and baby sperm whale that we've been following on our stream. We're recording tonight's stream because we have reports that the mother whale is distressed. And we don't want to surprise viewers if these reports are true. After discovering a whale fall in our research zone, we suspected that the whales may have been exposed to a toxin or pathogen and are currently investigating. Samples from several females in the pod tested positive for a toxin that we believe resulted from exposure to a harmful algal bloom near the coastal area just outside our research zone. As I approach the whales, I'm going to turn off my mic, but keep on my video feed. <gasps> no. Whales that we tested showed low level of this toxin, so we do not believe they will suffer from long-term effects. However, we expect that the mother whale was exposed to a higher level and was also more vulnerable because of her pregnancy. Stay close to your aunties. They know the way. As far as we know, those were the only two whales affected by the bloom. With all of Andre's technology genius, he still hasn't invented a way to be in two places at the same time. Before my flight home landed, Irina and Andre had already confirmed the location of the harmful bloom. I stayed close to home with Nana until she passed the next year. Ren moved in with me to save money while she finished school, which was great. Mostly. It was Ren's idea to keep the live stream going remotely using one of Andre's drones. But it was my fabulous idea to have Ren join the stream to choose the questions from the audience. She is definitely a hit. I can't lie. It's great to be diving again. While I was away, the baby became an auntie. I think she likes it. She still buzzes me when I play my Coda sounds, 
So that is still a mystery. But I swear, we understand each other completely. We're burdened from a time when we thought the ocean was too big to fail. You can't take anything for granted. Even though the ocean is so big, it is sensitive. The oceans are the kidneys of the earth. They recycle material and, and filter it out. Most people don't know that. They're not aware. They see the ocean as a sewer that they can dump anything into and it's out of sight, out of mind. Nothing is out of sight, out of mind on this planet. Everything is connected. We are absolutely in this mix of biogeochemistry, and our role so far has been consumptive and destructive. If we are to continue to have a planet that works, we have to heal the harm we've caused. What's the worst case scenario if we deny that the climate is changing, but actually it is, and we do nothing? then billions of people's lives will be directly affected just by sea level rise alone, let alone the other effects of climate change. So it's not about who's right, it's about the consequences of being wrong in the decision that we make right now. Educating everybody from school children, fishermen, tourists, if we can manage to do that, we have a very good future and we can gain a lot from the ocean. If we could establish the foundation for interspecies communication, we could make first contact. And that's where I hope the future goes. Because what we really want is curious, conscientious, and a self-correcting population. You changing can affect all the people around you to walk instead of drive, to buy a hybrid, to ride a bicycle, to not use single-use plastic. Imagine if everybody did that. The effect would be tremendous. We do have the power of choice about what we eat, what we wear, how we travel, all the things that we do in an everyday way. Times seven billion will make all the difference in the world. We must protect the ocean as if our lives depend on it, because they do.